So thank you for coming to uh, CCIG. We, uh, we welcome you. Uh, how many of you in the room are CCIG clients? How many of you in the room are not CCIG clients? Yet. <laughs> we'll be working on that. So I'm sure you woke up this morning and said, uh, hey, I want to go learn about OSHA record keeping. This session is going to be more exciting than the next episode of Yellowstone. <laughs> okay, the humor doesn't get any better than that either. Uh, I would caution you that if you're offended by sarcasm, honestly, you should get up and leave right now. Because no boring subject is complete without a little bit of lightheartedness and a little bit of poking fun and having fun. So, of the, all the topics that I do training in, this one will always generate the most questions. Anybody come armed with questions? You've got this situation or you know a guy that has this claim, right? Well, maybe you'll have questions as we continue because why, why do you think we timed this for January? Why would, why would CCIG do a, a record keeping workshop in January? Yeah, because your logs are due by February 1. So we could have done it in September, but then you'd forget everything. We could have done it in March, and that would have been a month and a half too late. So here we are today. So I would encourage you, as far as questions are concerned, uh, I keep talking. If you've got a question, throw your hand up or just toss your question out, and we will address those as we go. We're going to take a break, uh, maybe after an hour, or if I start to see people with their head in their hand and a little drool coming out the corner of your mouth, we'll know it's time to get up and get another cup, cup of coffee or take a break. So that's what we have planned. So one of the things I probably failed to do that I should have done in this presentation was explain why this is important. Because a lot of people, a lot of people say, you know what, I, I know we have to keep these logs and what's the harm if I have an injury and just decide to go ahead and put that injury on the log. I'm erring on the safe side. Is there any, anyone in the room who would object to the statement I just made? Tabor? Yeah. Why, why would that be a problem? It could affect your premiums and obviously your dart rate and all that kind of stuff. Other companies look at you and there's just several different aspects. Yeah, so for many of the companies that are represented in this room, OSHA record keeping is hugely important to the company. When you, when you make the mistake by saying, I don't want to make any mistakes, so I'm going to put that injury on the log, you're potentially putting your company at a disadvantage because other people, including the government, for many of you in the room, are looking at what's on those logs and determining whether or not you're a safe company. So if you have an injury, and you put it on the log, but it didn't need to be on the log, it's making you appear as though there are more people being injured than you should be actually taking credit for. So, that's one of the things that we're going to impress upon you. The other thing, this may be the most important concept to think about in the room. There is a huge difference between a worker's compensation claim and an OSHA recordable. You literally could have a half million dollar workers' comp claim that is not a, a uh, OSHA recordable. Now that may, that may be a little bit on the absurd side, but the point is workers' compensation and OSHA recordability are two entirely separate things. And if your methodology is simply to take a workers' comp claim and put it on the log without looking at the criteria that we're going to be talking about today, you're really kind of putting yourself at a disadvantage. So that's me. That's my contact information. Um, the best way to get a hold of me by phone is, is not my office number. It's my cell phone number, if anybody wants to jot that down. Uh, I always make an offer because I'm kind of passionate about this subject because I live a really boring life. So people with a boring life would be passionate about record keeping. Incidentally, 
This is a disadvantage for me to be mic'd and filmed because I'm in the witness protection program and this is, this may be the last presentation or my last day on earth. But anyway, if you would, if you would have a question, I'd be happy to answer that whether you're a client or not, for free, no charge, because I get into this stuff. So my mobile number is 708-212-4488. If you're going to call on the weekend, prefer it to be after about 7 o'clock in the morning. All right. So what I'd like to do first is I'd, I'd like to bring people up to speed on what's going on with the agency. We're going to talk about record keeping, but I think it's important to know what the agency is doing and what direction it's headed in. So the first thing I want to get out of the way is COVID. I, I'm hoping, I'm really hoping, fingers crossed, that that word becomes extinct and it's in our rear view mirror on a permanent basis very, very soon. But relative to what we're talking about today, uh, OSHA does require that you record work-related cases of COVID on the OSHA log. How do you determine that? They tried to come up with a scheme for you to make, be able to make that determination. If somebody else at your workplace had COVID and another employee tests positive and you're able to determine, believe it or not, this is what they use, that that individual was potentially working within six feet of the other person who tested positive for COVID, that, that might be a criteria for you to record the incident. But the disease is so contagious, it's impossible to make that determination. So my advice to you is if you're going to err on any side, err on the side of not making it a work-related case because there just isn't enough evidence to tie the two together. Make sense? OSHA does expect that you're going to go through the motions to determine if the case is related. Uh, God forbid, if you have a work-related case that results in uh, death or hospitalization, work-related, you are required to report that to OSHA. We're gonna talk more about that <coughs> reporting requirement a little bit later. Um, and that just basically repeats what I just said. Another interesting, I found this very interesting. When, when OSHA came out with all the guidance about COVID, initially, they instructed, remember we had a big issue in the country about mandating COVID vaccines in the workplace? So, and employers to my knowledge, depending on the state and jurisdiction, are still able to mandate the COVID vaccine. So initially OSHA said, anytime an employer mandates a vaccine or any medical type situation, if there's an adverse reaction to that mandated medical vaccine or whatever, it was to be recorded on the OSHA log. A month later, they reversed that and said if there's an adverse reaction to COVID vaccine, you, you do not report it on the log. Ironically, if you required, mandated an employee to have a uh, um, tetanus, Vaccination is part of their employment and they had a reaction that is reported on the log. So the only mandated medical vaccination that is not to be reported on the log is a COVID vaccine, which I don't know, strange. <laughs> but all that's been reversed now, correct? As far as OSHA even being involved with COVID vaccines? Correct. As of January? Correct. Last year? Yes. Yeah. The, the issue of mandating the COVID vaccine at work relative to OSHA mandating that is, is no longer in play. So we're, we're what? Two years into another administration now. Because OSHA falls under the Department of Labor, uh, it is an administrative issue and it changes depending on which party occupies the White House. So it's important to kind of track where the agency is headed, what some of their priorities are, um, be because that's going to set the tone for what we need to prepare for as employers. 
So because Biden was President Obama's vice president, the current administration really does kind of look a lot like it did in the Obama administration. COVID impacted the number of inspections that OSHA conducted for the past couple of years. I mean, there, when you look at the data, the number of inspections that were conducted, it dropped off the table because their compliance officers were discouraged from going into workplaces unless there was a fatality or a complaint that appeared to be very legitimate. Otherwise, they conducted business over the phone and internet. So if you look at the numbers lately, their inspectors are out there. And they're adding, they're adding staff. So two years ago, I would say, you know, the chances of an, inspe an inspection simply because of COVID are way down. Now we're back to normal and they're hiring. So I would expect more inspections to occur in the coming months and years. <clears throat> something else that, uh, something else that you need to be aware of and, and probably a remote fear at best. But in the Obama administration, when there was a large inspection that was conducted, if there were a lot of citations and penalties, penalties are the word for fines, if there were a lot of citations and penalties, it was very common for OSHA to issue a press release. So in addition to issuing those citations and penalties, um, what OSHA would do is write a press release essentially shaming the employer. And, and they felt that by publicly shaming the employer in the media and the press would motivate the employer to do the right thing. In my career, I have seen employers that certainly need to be shamed. But they tended to spread this across all employers. And I was personally involved maybe five years ago with a client who was a, uh, a leader and a pillar in the community. He owned several manufacturing plants. And unfortunately, they had several fingertip amputations, which draws attention. They had decent guarding. They had uh, decent safety training. In general, this was a good solid safety program. But in order to make a point, OSHA came in and issued about $200,000 in penalties and numerous citations. And they wrote a press release that made this owner, I, I, was, I was surprised he didn't have a heart attack when I met with him. Because it stated that the owner in this company didn't care about the safety of their employees. That's a pretty, pretty bizarre statement to make. How do they know what he cares or doesn't care about? There were, there were issues that they took care of. So this is a practice that the current administration believes would be helpful. We, some of us may agree, some of us may disagree. Again, you, you have to look at the company and a company that, you, you can tell if a company is doing anything or not. The fact that your companies have people in the room today to learn about this tells me that you're already a step ahead of others that aren't. Something else which is, uh, is something that you, you really need to be aware of. How many of you in the room are aware of the electronic record keeping requirements for your business? That's interesting. A lot of the hands that didn't go up, your businesses may already be subject to a requirement that you take the information from the 300A and file it electronically with the government. Failure to do that could result in, in some issues. So currently, right now, all you do is take the data from the 300A form, and we're gonna look at that a little bit later in the presentation, and you establish an account, online account, and report this data to OSHA. What the administration is thinking about doing is actually requiring you to provide the details of each incident in this system, and here's, here's, the, here's the, uh, the killer, and that information will then be made available to the public. Not the employee's name, but details regarding how many injuries are occurring in your workplace. 
that would be made available to the public. Many of you in the room right now already know that you can go to the OSHA website, put in the name of your company, and you can see how many inspections have been conducted, right? Those of you who want to see, it's not part of the training today, but I can, I can show you how to do that. So that information is publicly available. So what we're talking about here is an increase in the amount of detail that the government is intending to make available to the public. That's not in place yet, it's being discussed. As you can imagine, there will be a lot of pushback, in my opinion, as there should be. Can you have a company policy that since it is a policy, it would overwrite what, what government is requiring or asking for? Oh, can you go beyond? Well, I mean, in other words, if you don't want to supply whatever information that the government is asking for, you have a company policy. Can you go back and say the company, you know, we have a policy in place? So Norman asked a question, if, if our policy says that we cannot release information like that, and OSHA says that you must release, we must have that information and release it, you're out of luck. So the government agency overrides what the company policy is. So again, why am I bringing that up? I'm not bringing that up to frighten and confuse people. I'm bringing that up because that even more reinforces the need to do accurate record keeping. If this information is going to be made available to the public, you don't want to over-report because everybody's going to see this. <coughs> be disciplined about your approach in evaluating these injuries to make sure what you do and don't put on the log is correct. Uh, the only other thing of substance, to be honest, that I saw on the radar screen with OSHA is that they intend to issue a proposed regulation for infectious disease in the workplace. They said May, um, the way the government works, maybe May of 2024, not 23. So the, the government, the wheels of government turn very slowly. Uh, there are things that, uh, that pop up that kind of interfere with their plans, but um, because COVID was such a big deal in the workplace, those of you in healthcare, healthcare related, have heard of bloodborne pathogens, you know what I'm talking about. This would take it a step further, and this would be all infectious disease, uh, including uh, COVID. Something else that you should be aware of is that OSHA operates in regions of the country. There are 10 regions in the country. Colorado happens to be in region eight. Within OSHA, each of the regions are able to come up with their own special programs that they tend to enforce and reinforce. Some of that is based upon experience in the region with certain types of injuries that occur in the workplace. Some of, some of it is just because they feel a need to um, emphasize a particular aspect of safety in the workplace. There's actually 14 uh, local emphasis programs within Region 8 of OSHA. The ones that probably apply to most people in the room, either in construction or in non-construction, easiest way to describe it, noise exposure. So if you're operating a business, and this is non-construction, well, you might say, well, Gary, there's noise in construction, right? Why doesn't OSHA enforce noise in construction to the extent that they do in industry? Well, there's two different standards, and the standard for noise in industry is expansive. They have yet to write a regulation for noise in construction that is as stringent as the standard is for those in industry. So, which is ironic because noise is noise, and it really doesn't matter if you're in construction or a factory, if you're exposed to noise, you're gonna suffer the same hearing loss. So, that's, that's the reason why it's focused on non-construction. Forklifts. Forklifts have been kind of a big program for OSHA nationwide. Uh, forklift operator training is a big deal. So that applies to both construction as well as non-construction. 
work zone safety. This is the safety for workers that do our road work. That obviously applies to construction. It's an emphasis program here in Region 8. And then probably the one that's been on the books the longest is falls. Falls in construction. At what height do we need to protect workers in construction from falls? <laughs> well, I love this because it brings out the, uh, the cynic in me. Falls in an employee in construction must be protected from falls from zero feet. At what, what activity does OSHA require fall protection once you get in this device and you haven't even left the ground? Boom lift. So you can be one foot, and if you're one foot off the ground in a boom lift and you don't have somebody in a harness, citation. Six feet, one, a fall from one level of a building to another. Ten feet. Beth, what, is, what device? Scaffolding. If you're an iron worker, you can fall 15 and 30 feet before fall protection is required. Again, don't ask me the logic. Wouldn't a person who fell six feet be just as bad? Wouldn't a person falling 30 feet be just as badly or worse injured than somebody falling six feet? But it's, it's how the regulations are written. It's important that you know those details. All right. Any questions about what we've covered so far? How many of you are familiar with OSHA's site-specific targeting program? So, here's how that works. This program has been in place probably 15 years, and it's been on and off. It was recently reenacted in, in 2018. Now, how many of you are in construction? Breathe a sigh of relief because this doesn't apply to you yet. And I use the word yet carefully. But if you're non-construction and you are subject to OSHA's rec uh, record keeping requirements, uh, you are subject to the site specific targeting program. So. Remember I talked about the electronic record keeping. You're giving OSHA the data from the 300A form. You're telling them how many incidents there were in each of the categories and how many hours were worked. You're also telling them your industry code. And as we get deeper into this presentation, the industry code is hugely important. If you mistakenly use an injury code whose experience in aggregate is, reflects a less dangerous business operation than what you're really engaged in, you're establishing a goal that's not reasonable for your business. You have to look exactly at what you do, and I'll show you where to find this information. You need to set the right benchmark for yourself. And I can't tell you how many companies I've run across who have used a code that they were told to use by somebody in the organization that set them up for failure because it established a, a baseline, a, a benchmark rather, that would never reflect the operations they're involved in. And OSHA doesn't care that you've picked the right or the wrong one. When you file this data, they're going to look at your incident rates. And if they're higher than the benchmark that you've told them you're at, you're going to be inspected. So now, this site-specific targeting program is, and if you think about it, it makes sense. Why would an agency go out and inspect an operation who does a really, really good job in safety? and who has an excellent safety record. So in their mind, this is a way where you're self-reporting data to OSHA for them to look at, okay, here's what this company does, here are their incident rates. They are, what they're doing is injuring people at a rate higher than what they're telling us their peer group is. There must be something wrong. We're going to go inspect them. So site specific targeting. So they're going to look at what you self-report. If you're indicating that you're injuring people at a rate that is greater than what your peer group is, 
you, you should prepare for an inspection. And they have the data. You're giving it to them. Once again, I go back, I'm like a broken record. Do we have records anymore? Oh yeah, they're coming back into fashion. So you're setting yourself up for failure. That's why it's so important to only put on the log what you are required to put on the log. You should be looking for as many reasons why that injury shouldn't go on the log as possible. That is the right way to look at this. Um, they are looking at, and I don't know how they find this out, but if you've never filed electronically and you're supposed to file electronically, if they run across you, uh, there's going to be an issue. And you would be issued citations for not complying with the electronic reporting program. <laughs> this, this, <laughs> this one really kind of irritates me. The other thing they're doing is they expect that people will be lying about their injury experience. So they're actually doing spot checks of companies that are reporting really, really good safety results. So you, I, I'm not familiar with anyone who's been inspected for that particular reason, but it's in the policy and they state the fact that they're gonna do this. How they would do that, they would actually come into your place of business and they would ask to see release forms they would ask to, ask to see medical treatment forms that would indicate what kind of treatment was provided to a particular employee. And if that did not appear on the log, you would be subject to record keeping violations. The rate that OSHA focuses on is the DART rate. So in safety, because we're really not smart people, we use a lot of acronyms to make people think we're smarter than we are. So we're looking specifically at the DART rate. That stands for days away, restricted, or transfer. DART. So that would involve an injury that involves either, either lost work days or restricted work activity. That is the type of incident that OSHA is focusing their attention on. So this, OSHA is currently using data from calendar years 2017 to 19. That's currently the data that they're looking at when they're evaluating which workplaces to go inspect based upon the information that was provided. A comprehensive list is provided to each of the area offices and the area offices, which is an office that would be in the Denver area here, are looking at the list of employers and they're targeting employers for inspection based upon this data. The reason why they do it locally, the local inspectors may know, oh yeah, I've been at that company three times. That's going to be on the priority list for me to go back and visit because they've had issues in the past. So each area office is able to focus down on that list and target the companies that they wish to inspect. One difference here, which, which is a disadvantage, is previously, and I'm talking 10 years ago, site-specific targeting, I could go into a database. They made it difficult to find, but I could go into a database and I could see the companies who had reported incident rates higher than average, and I would be able to use that list and reach out and tell you, you're on this list prepare for an inspection. You may not be inspected, but the, the wise choice is to prepare for a possible inspection. Everyone in this room should be prepared for an OSHA inspection. How many of you have a protocol in writing on how to handle an OSHA inspection? The hands up in the room, a very wise thing to do. If you don't have a protocol, I would strongly encourage you to take a look at developing a protocol. I can help you. But I could tell you horror stories in a factory where OSHA came in, announced themselves to the receptionist, explained that they were there under the law to conduct a workplace inspection, and then the receptionist allows them into the plant without anyone else knowing about it. Is that a good thing or a bad thing? Bad thing. So 
on your list of things to do, and I'd be happy to guide you and help you through that process, you should have something in place and, and actually practice that that uh, helps people understand how to, how to proceed with an OSHA inspection. So they're not publishing this list, which, you know, publishing people that are on a list and that being exposed to the public is a bad thing, but, but we would know who is on the list to be inspected and I could notify you, but that's no longer in play. The agency is conducting inspections under this initiative. So think about it. If you're on the list, we need to do everything we can to, to do what we can to move things in a different direction because the way OSHA comes into your facility is they see that this, this particular company is experiencing accidents at a rate that is larger, greater than average for companies that do what you do. Therefore, when they find a problem, it's an expectation that they'll find a problem. For a company that had a very successful safety record and they see a violation, the attitude would be, well, that, that's an exception to the rule. Do, do you follow my logic? That if you're reporting a high number of incidents and they find issues, that's a correlation. Well, of course. Of course this is a violation. So we want to head in a different direction. It changes the perspective. Any questions so far about anything we've covered? Hard to believe no questions about that site-specific targeting, but All right, so let's get into the record. I have a question. Our company is set up, um, it's kind of funky because we're a restaurant group and we have different EINs for each of our stores. And so they're essentially separate entities. Yes. But through CCIG, we are insured as like a community one, under one EIN. Um, when do you kind of call it to report to OSHA? Because technically, each of our stores are under 100 employees. That's a great question. Because we keep logs, but we don't necessarily record it because each of our stores are like 20 employees. So the, the re we're going to get into the details for electronic re uh, record keeping, but the, cr the, the threshold is 20. So if you have more than 20 employees at one location, you're going to keep a separate log at that location, right? But if it's more than 20 at that location, that has to be reported electronically. Okay. All right. So let, let's take a look at the record keeping standard. Uh, we have the 19, I, I love this. People think, is that when they were written? We have the 1926 standards. What does that apply to? Construction. We have the 1910 standards. What does that apply to? General industry. Very good. Record keeping is its own standard. It's 1904, the year I graduated with a safety degree. <laughs> they had those back then. The car, you know, cars had just been invented and we needed safety in automobiles. So anyway, part 1904, record keeping. It, it, falls over everybody. So the way we record an injury in construction is no different than the way we record an injury in industry. We, we also have actually separate safety standards for shipbuilding. We have the Mine Safety and Health Administration. But record keeping goes over all of those. And I'm going to go through each part of it. So let's, what is the purpose of the record keeping standard? And the slides are as stupid as my jokes. So. If you don't enjoy the pictures, you know, you pl please feel free to make a comment that the humor, humor sucked, the, the pictures were stupid. Um, please feel free to pick it apart. So, the purpose of the standard is to require that employers record all new work-related injuries and illnesses. <laughs> what I want to point out, and this is in OSHA's own words, they're basically saying in this passage here, which has a lot of legalese, that there is a huge difference between a work comp claim and OSHA recordable. Having an OSHA recordable does not necessarily mean that that is a com compensable work comp claim. And having a work comp claim doesn't mean that it's OSHA recordable. 
That is the biggest mistake that I see people make, is when they have a work comp claim, they automatically put it on the log. Stop that right now. Let's take a different approach to how we, we keep our records. The scope, the scope of the record keeping standard. Now this is, I, I need to make sure that everybody understands this. So OSHA record keeping, keeping a log itself is only required for employers with 10 or more employees. If you have less than 10 employees, you don't have to keep an OSHA log. That's probably very rare for the people that are in this room. And the size exemption really only applies to the number of employees at any one location, the total number of employees at any one location. There are companies that are exempt from record keeping. For example, CCIG as an insurance broker is not required to keep OSHA logs at all. We could have 10,000 employees and we don't have to keep OSHA logs. Banks and financial institutions are not required to keep OSHA logs. Anybody have any ideas why? Yeah, OSHA actually applied the standard to those business. It's not as though people don't get hurt at CCIG. I'll likely trip over this court at some point today and you can laugh at me. That will be good humor and better than the humor I use. But the fact is that OSHA exempts certain industries from keeping records, which is interesting because, anybody ever heard of BLS? I know you're saying, well, the BLS, that's BS. What does the BLS do? Bureau of Labor Statistics. Bill, you, you like statistics. So the BLS data for all industries. So it's possible that even though you're not required to keep an OSHA log, that you could get information from the BLS, and I've seen this happen, who says for the next year, you're going to keep an OSHA log even though you don't have to, and this is required if you're subject to BLS. And they want to see your accident and injury data so that they can continue to keep benchmarks even though logs themselves are not required to be maintained by OSHA. And uh, if you're exempt from record keeping or if you're subject to record keeping, this is in the appendices to the 1904 standards. Um, the interesting thing though, and this is what really confuses people, just because you're not subject to OSHA record keeping because you have less than 10 employees, you still have to comply with every OSHA regulation. So if we drove forklifts at CCIG, which we don't, I wouldn't be surprised. We're a we're an innovative company and we could have a forklift rodeo here someday. But if we had forklifts here, we would be required to train employees how to safely operate those forklifts. So just because we're exempt from record keeping doesn't mean that we have to do the other things that are in the regulations. Those apply to all employers. So, first advice I have is to if you don't keep logs in some businesses, my advice is keep a log if for no other reason to benchmark yourself against your peers because that data is available. It's just a good thing to do. You want to know if you're better or worse than competition. And again, I'm speaking on a subject, all of you are subject to record keeping, I'm guessing. If not, um, we can talk about that. But for those businesses that aren't subject to record keeping, it's, it's good just to benchmark yourself and know where you stand. All right, so let's talk a little bit about the, uh, and then we'll take a break. We'll probably take a break at about 9.30. Let's talk about the forms and criteria. And this is where we're going to get into a lot of discussion, making the determination whether or not something goes on the log. Work-relatedness is considered work-related activity in the work environment. Now, each of these words needs to be further defined that results in injury or illness. Or, and this is the part that gives a lot of you heartburn, aggravation of a pre-existing condition. The agency doesn't really care if somebody comes to work, and neither does the work comp law, care 
If somebody comes to work with you for you and their back is literally hanging by a thread, the minute they bend over and pick something up and re-injure their back, it's a work comp claim, but it's also an OSHA recordable. And that gives a lot of his heartburn, rightfully so. Your work really did little, very little, to cause that injury because they came to you in such a precarious position. But it's the law. And this is one case where that is the case as worker cop claim. It's the case with an OSHA recordable. The work environment, it's a location where people are working. This now can include work at home. I have a few comments to make about work at home that hopefully will give you a little bit of relief. Um, it also includes equipment and materials. So it's, it's pretty easy to define a work environment as long as an employee is engaged in work and, uh, and on the clock, so to speak. There are some exemptions, and I'll explain these, to the work environment. If an employee is present in your workplace, but not on the clock and just there, they borrowed a tool from somebody. And to return the tool, they weren't working that day, so they went to the job site to return the tool. If they're injured, <coughs> excuse me, if they're injured in the process of returning that tool, they trip and fall on something, they're not on the clock, not recordable. Voluntary participation in company activities. You have a picnic, there's a pickup softball game, somebody rounds first base, takes a slide into second, and tears their ACL. <coughs> if they're there, voluntary, not recordable. <laughs> The problem is some companies kind of make it uh, you're being voluntold to participate in those activities. And because, you're, uh, because you played semi-pro ball, you are going to play on our, our company softball team. Um, if it's a requirement and they're injured at a company activity, then it is actually a recordable event. Just something to be aware of. Pleased to hear that if, if an employee is injured while eating, cooking or drinking, that that's not your recordable injury. If they can't competently eat and they're injured while eating, like they poke themselves with a fork or something, you don't have to record it. Isn't that encouraging? We're getting somewhere now, aren't we? Injured while performing personal tasks. Thank God they don't define what those tasks are. Um, I'd rather not think about it. If an employee is in, can you believe this is actually in a standard? Employees that are injured while grooming or taking medication. I'm dedicated to safety. I have virtually eliminated the need for grooming to prevent injury. That's how committed I am to this occupation. And it's good to know that if somebody self-harms themselves at work, that's not your, your responsibility either. I still can't believe they put these things in there. Uh, auto accidents on company property when commuting. So th this is kind of interesting. If two cars collide in your parking lot and one of the two parties is injured, that's not a recordable. However, if an employee has parked their car, they're on their way, to the workplace and somebody pulls in and hits them in their vehicle, that is recordable. So think about it this way. Two vehicles collide. If the collision involves a pedestrian either leaving work or coming to work with another vehicle, that is recordable. Interestingly, and, and this is still in the record keeping standard because we talked about COVID before. For many years, especially in the healthcare industry, OSHA made it very clear that it is not your obligation as an employer to report the occurrence of the common cold or flu because it's prevalent in our society. So even in a healthcare setting, when you're working with sick patients, the flu is not required to be reported on the log, but COVID is. So you could have flesh-eating bacteria in a healthcare setting that's transferred to a worker, and that is, by the current statute, not really required to be reported, but 
COVID would be. So we, we have this unusual focus on, on one disease over another, but just understand that. Mental illness, and this sounds kind of strange, but I can give you a good example for it. Mental illness is not OSHA recordable unless it's work-related. And what I'm talking about there sometimes happens in the workplace with a tragedy. So if you have employees that witness a fatality at the workplace, if they become impacted mentally from that injury that they witness, that treatment could be considered to be recordable. I don't know how many times that happens, but it's, it's in the standard. Have you seen mental illness on an OSHA 300? Like, is it, is it phrased as a diagnosis kind of situation, or is it? So the question was, ha have I ever seen a mental illness case on the OSHA log? I've seen employees on logs that should be qualified as a mental illness, but no, not, not specifically, Nate. I have not seen that, nor do I really know what the, the parameters are, whether it needs to be a diagnosis, if they're given, obviously if they're given medication, that could be a trigger. It's an unusual thing, but the agency has considered that. So we kind of touched on uh, transportation related, travel related injuries when it comes to reporting it to work in a parking lot. So here's some criteria when it comes to how OSHA views travel related injuries. If you have an employee who stays in a hotel and they're injured, they're out of town, they're in a, in a hotel because they're doing work the next day, if they're injured in the hotel, they slip and fall, whatever it might happen to be, those are generally not recordable. Injuries sustained in motor vehicle accidents while commuting from the motel to whatever the job site or project is that they're going to, commuting, not, not recordable. When we get up in the morning, we drive to work. If we're involved in a motor vehicle accident, it's, it's not recordable. We're not on the clock. Now, a foreman going from, foreman gets up in the morning, goes to job site A. Injuries sustained in an accident, not recordable. But when they go from job site A to job site B, superintendent, those are recordable. <laughs> this is stupid. I don't even want to cover this. But they actually say that if, if you're going from job site A to job site B, and you, you need a bottle of water, and you see a 7-Eleven and pull off the road to get the bottle of water, if you slip and fall on the ice, that is a reasonable detour from point A to point B. And that would be recordable. But if I have a barbecue place that I want to eat lunch at that's 10 miles out of my way from point A to point B, then my injuries are not recordable. It's, Somebody actually thought of this and wrote it. I'm just repeating what somebody else wrote. Hey, Gary. I think we went a little bit too far. I think we skipped one. One more. Okay, maybe. It was before the travel related injury. Oh, yeah, great, great point. Thank you. Fast finger. This, <laughs> thank you, Kenny, because this really is an important point. Who determines what goes on the log? You have guidelines, but at the end of the day, who makes that determination? You do. You do, using the criteria. So if, if, you, have, if you have a 50-50 call to make on something, you make the determination if that should go on the log or not go on the log. OSHA will tell you, just like I will, <coughs> what the criteria is, right? But at the end of the day, you are the person, who, whoever it is at your company that maintains these logs, makes the determination as to whether or not that goes on the log. That's your job. There is no OSHA hotline to call and say, I need to know if this is recordable or not. They're going to give you the criteria, but they're not going to tell you. So before we break, I, I have a funny and, and possibly inappropriate story to tell, which is a true story, but one of the jobs I had in Texas, um, 
we had a, a group of traveling salespeople selling chemicals and sci scientific equipment and supplies. They've been purchased and bought out. They're no longer in business. But, but we had a sales rep who was out of town that slipped and fell and uh, I believe it was a collarbone. I believe she slipped and fell in the shower and broke her collarbone. So given what we talked about so far, where does it look like that that's going? No. Not, not recordable, right? Personal activities happening in, in a hotel. Well, how many of you have very aggressive accident investigation programs? We, we all should, right? Because what's, what's the point of doing an accident investigation? Learn from it so that, so you don't repeat it again. Novel concept, right? So we did a rather extensive accident investigation. It was me and the corporate attorney I was working with. So during the investigation, of course, you always ask if there may have been a witness, right? So kind of a strange question, but we, we asked the question, was there a witness? And, and the sales rep said, uh, well, yeah, as, as fate would have it, um, there was a witness who happened to be in the shower with me. So as we pursued that, well, you know, would it be possible for us to, to take a witness statement and, and see what they knew or understood? And uh, the sales rep said, well, uh, I suppose so. Uh, he's actually a prospect of mine. So given all the facts of the situation, initially we had a slip and fall in a shower that would normally be considered to be not recordable, but given the fact that she was trying to close the deal with this prospective client, we determined that it was in the course and scope of employment, and of course, this is an OSHA recordable event. <laughs> and better yet, a pat on the back because at the end of the day she did close that deal. So she got the sale, it's all good, we've got the business, unfortunately we had a collarbone injury. So with that, why don't we take uh, 10, 12, 15 minutes, something like that, you can refresh your coffee and, and we'll come back together. So I touched on this, uh, <clears throat> touched on this a little earlier, work-related injuries in the home. You know, when, when, OSHA, when OSHA first came into play, never really considered anything about work-related injuries at home because people didn't work at home. And uh, things changed, things changed, and then COVID occurred. And all of a sudden, we got a lot of people working at home. And I think we're beginning to transition back to a non-COVID environment where uh, people are beginning to return to the workplace. But it's still a significant exposure. And uh, yeah, I mean, if, if you really start to analyze this, <coughs> you know, the fear would be, oh my, my, my gosh, what's, what's going to happen? Our OSHA, is OSHA going to go into our employees' home? to make sure that it's a safe work environment for that person. And number one, they don't have staffing to do it. There just aren't enough OSHA inspectors to go visit people that work from their home. So there were concerns, as you might imagine, on the part of uh, employers regarding workplace injuries that occur in a home. So OSHA actually came out with some pretty reasonable guidance for determining which injuries should or should not be reported, or recorded rather, that occur in the home. And, and so, very common sense, because you are not responsible for the housekeeping of your employees in their homes. At work, yes, hugely important, right? Housekeeping is a major issue involving safety in the workplace. But you can't control it at home. That's their choice. So if you have an employee who is working from home and slips and falls on the stairs because there's dog, to dog toys littering the steps of every stair, that is not a work-related injury. But if they do things like pick up boxes or 
We have a lot of people working on computers at home, right? Carpal tunnel, cumulative trauma type injuries. If people are working at home, there is some consideration that needs to be given to providing an ergonomically safe and appropriate workspace. So if you had somebody who's doing data entry or working on a computer extensively from home and they have a case of carpal tunnel which the doctor relates to a workplace exposure, that would be recorded on your log. So I, I think that's a reasonable approach that the agency makes to limit things to situations or conditions that may contribute to a workplace injury in the home. Any questions about that? All right, so let's take a look at what OSHA defines as recordable events. So at the top of the list are, are deaths in the workplace. Um, in my career, you know, one time in my career when I worked at a chemical plant I had to call I had to call a family and say that their father was never coming home. Never is something you never want to be involved in. And later in my life, working, uh, working in consulting with insurance brokers, I've, I've dealt with many dozens of deaths. The worst thing ever. Worst thing ever. And I can't think of one case that I've been involved in that couldn't have been prevented. It wasn't the chunk of blue ice that fell out of a Southwest airplane that happened to hit somebody in the head at a job site. They were all preventable. I, I'd leave you with, with that message. So deaths are recordable. Injuries that were a result in lost work days are recordable. Injuries that result in restrictions. Events that result in medical treatment. We're going to dig deeper into these things. Loss of consciousness. If you have an employee who suffers a loss of consciousness at work, and it's determined that the loss of consciousness was work related, then that loss of consciousness, irrespective of if that employee received any medical treatment, had restrictions, or lost work time, the simple fact that it was a work related loss of consciousness must be reported on the log. And then the catch all, which is really kind of interesting significant or injury that's diagnosed by a physician. Um, or a licensed healthcare professional. So can anybody in this room, and it was a subject I'm going to see if you were paying attention, I talked about special emphasis that OSHA has in Region 8. What is a significant injury or illness that wouldn't result in medical treatment, restrictions, or lost work days, but is a diagnosis that has to be recorded on the log? Hearing loss. Very good. Bonus points. Unfortunately, I don't have the $1,000 gift card that I was supposed to hand out today. <clears throat> so hearing loss. Medically diagnosed hearing loss goes on the log, even though it may not result in anything, any kind of medical treatment. All right, let's, let's dig in. <clears throat> this is important stuff. Recording lost work days and restricted work days. The physician determines how many days that employee loses. Here's an example, and this happens quite a bit. So the employee goes to see the doc, doc releases them to return to work with restrictions. Or actually, doc says you can't return to work for three days. Let's use that example. But the employee, who's a hardworking, dedicated, loyal employee, shows up for work the next day. And you're looking at it going, well, you know what? Doc said they can't return to work, but he showed up. Says he can do the job. Maybe I don't have to put that on the log, right? Nope. It's what goes on the release form. Now, a lot of this, I'm going to be suggesting to you to control your injuries on the log that you have programs in place that are designed to get that employee to a medical provider who is willing to work with you, who is also willing to recognize the implications of OSHA's record keeping standard to make sure that as little damage as possible is inflicted on your OSHA log while providing the employee with good treatment. 
give you another situation. So, because this cuts both ways. The employee sees the physician, says, you may return to work tomorrow with or without restrictions, doesn't matter, and the employee doesn't show up for five days. So, okay, he didn't show up for work. So I guess I have to put that on the log, right? Nope. Go back to the restrictions. The physician issued release form. We follow, it cuts both ways. I suggest to you that you need to have a conversation at the clinic before that employee is even released. Why do I say that? Do they know if you have a, an aggressive return to work policy? What I'm suggesting is, as soon as that employee goes, and you should be taking them to the clinic. Some, some employers say, well, yeah, here's our clinic. Go ahead and go to them. Drive yourself there injured for treatment. Not a good idea. What I'm trying to suggest here is the importance of control. Control over every incident that happens. In fact, uh, I've got a guest who I'd like to share a story. Beth, are you comfortable sharing the story? Sure. You want this last Friday story or last April? Uh, no, I, 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 like, I like last Friday. Now, we have an issue because you're not being recorded, but we'll, we'll satisfy that. But I've been working with Beth. And, and Beth is the perfect example of a client who really has an effective strategy in safety and an effective strategy in what happens after an injury occurs. And it's a pretty remarkable story, so. Yes. Um, so my name is Beth Lundquist. I'm one of the owners of Hegem Lundquist. We're a subcontractor that does steel stud framing, drywall, acoustical ceilings, paint, plaster, EFIS, you name it, we do it. Um, we've been in business for 74 years, and I am a third generation owner. It was started by my grandfather. Safety is our third highest um, cost here at Hegem Lundquist. So safety, I took over safety about 10 years ago. Um, at one point, we had our EMOD rate down to a 0.68, and I contribute that to the actual legwork that I did um, going to all of the clinics through throughout the Denver metro area meeting with them and choosing the right designated providers um, and I'm actually one of our designated medical providers just closed in December so I'm back out there um, meeting with all of them seeing what they can do what they can provide to my family because my family includes all of my workers. Last year, on average, we had 192 um, employees, and we uh, got up to just over 200, but 192. I was going back and doing a little research. Last year, we had 11 accidents, 11, but only four were recordable. Um, and I base that on not only the work that I do, but our designated medical providers. So on Friday, I'm at Children's Hospital looking at how we're going to set up a scaffold over um, drywall partitions, existing electrical, mechanical, everything that you can imagine. You can't reach this place. We're going to have to come up with something that is outside of OSHA, have everybody signed off on it. And I get a phone call that someone had just fallen from stilts. Okay, who's the employee? I don't know his name. What do you mean you don't know his name? Like, what's his name? How am I supposed to start a, a case, a file? So about 45 minutes into it, um, I had asked um, someone to go up to, this happened in Boulder. So I asked someone to drive up there on my behalf, collect our injured worker so that we could get him to one of our designated medical providers. 45 minutes after the initial injury, our employee decided to call 911. Um, I was very against it from the get-go. Uh, the general contractor pushed back on me. I had no support from the general contractor. In fact, I felt very badgered by them. They kept saying, your employee's in pain and you're not offering him anything. And I said, I have two superintendents on the job site that are willing and able to get him into a truck and take him to our designated medical provider. He's not unconscious. There's no broken 
obvious open, broken, fractured wounds of any kind. He's not bleeding. He's, he's fine. He's in pain. And everybody has a, a threshold for pain that's different, and that's something that we, you know, we obviously don't know how to handle. But um, calling 911, a fall from stilts, I knew that this could potentially become an overnight hospitalization stay. So um, after I drove to Midtown, where I filed my claim in the parking lot, I then drove up to Boulder Community Hospital and sat in a room with this gentleman. Um, X-rays, MRIs, things like that were taken. Um, it was fortunate enough that there was nothing seriously wrong with the gentleman. And I was able to then once get him in my car and take him to our designated medical provider. Um, we actually walked out of there with zero restrictions. He's been at work. He showed up yesterday at 6 a.m. He will continue to do light duty work at my office even though he has zero restrictions. Again, that, that um, communication that I have with those physicians that are designated medical provider, it is, it is huge. Um, I walked in because I, I had been at Children's Hospital and then had been en route. Uh, they had a copy of our task letter and our Rule 6, a blank copy. I have them printed off, um, you know, got the drug screen done. Um, most hospitals won't do a drug screen for you if it's work comp related, so I highly recommend you uh, always make sure that you get them directly to your designated milk provider for that. And I had them um, fill out a or print me out a copy of our task letter and our Rule 6 because at that time that I was in with our designated milk provider, if there were going to be restrictions, I already knew that Wednesday was going to be the day that that guy was mandatory to show up so that we could um, only have that to um, a certain amount of lost days. So um, is there anything else you wanted me to talk and no, about? And no medication? And no, no medication. Um, Gary and I, <laughs> they, I did find out that um, he's, he's a, English is a second language, um, so the communication barrier is very hard for me. And um, I did find out that they did give him an IV, which is outside of the realm of first aid, but Gary and I are going to probably fight that so that um, there's no medication. Right. <laughs> And it's first date only. Thank, thank you, Beth. Is there anything else? No, okay. thank you. And, and the reason I wanted Beth to tell her story was to impress upon you the importance of controls in place. Number one, we want the employee to be seen and evaluated and treated appropriately, but not over-treated. Anybody ever find an experience where medical providers tend to overtreat work comp claims? Yeah, because it's a no, no, no questions asked system. If this treatment is given, it'll be paid for. So that's a remarkable story of, can anybody see how that might have ended up in a totally different direction? So my point is, this is something that you have control over. And I would encourage you to put programs in place that are just as comprehensive and, and just as effective because it's, it's in the best interest of your worker, as Beth indicated, the priority was getting that person evaluated correctly and treated, and it's in your best interest as well. So here's another mistake that people make on the log. We now count calendar days. Anybody know why we count calendar days when many years ago we only counted scheduled work days? Come on, there's got to be somebody in the room as cynical as me. Well, back in the day, I referred to it as creative record keeping. And it was amazing that if an employee was injured and couldn't work for the next two weeks, miraculously, we just indicated that that employee wasn't scheduled to work for the next two weeks. For vacation. <laughs> right? Anybody with me? So OSHA knew that people were playing that game where these employers are just going to say that employee wasn't scheduled to work anyway because of lack of work. Who knows what excuse they would have come up with. So they said, now you have to count calendar days. But by switching from scheduled work days to calendar days, they had to put a cap 
on the total number of days lost in any one calendar year. Otherwise, it would look like work has suddenly become so dangerous that people are losing an inordinate number of work days. But there's something really, really important that you need to pay attention to here. Very common. Worker is injured on a Friday. They go to the clinic, which we've suggested you need to have tight connections with. They're seen by the physician. It's a minor injury, okay? Maybe it's a sprain, maybe it's a strain. Physician asks the employee, this is Friday, when are you scheduled to work next? Monday. All right. They write the release for a, a return to work on Monday. You know what just happened? You just ate a two-day lost workday claim. Remember, it's the release, the physician release. Doesn't matter, he was scheduled to work on Monday. You count calendar days. If, you, if that employee is able to be returned to work, that release needs to say, return to work on that day. Otherwise, you're setting yourself up. I can't tell you how many times I have, one of the things I do when I look at a, at, at a client's OSHA log, what sticks out like a sore thumb, if I see three or four lost workday injuries on the log, and each one is one or two days in length, really? So they were hurt badly enough that they couldn't do anything for two days, and then miraculously on the third day, they, they're released on full duty. Does that seem likely to you? Something's wrong, something's wrong. So we need, that goes back to the programs Beth talked about, programs you should have in place. That's just suspicious, and it's, it's a red flag to me. I actually, once, I actually once had a contractor, electrical contractor, and he was denied work. It was a good, reputable contractor. Denied work because his incident rate of lost work days was too high. So I looked at the log, and he had the box checked for lost workday. And then you know you have the column for the days lost. He had written one half on like three or four of these lost workday events. And I said, Kevin, I, I'm, I'm not following. Why do you have one half day for the number of lost workdays? You know what he told me? He goes, Gar, we, we send people to the clinic, and even if it's like 9 o'clock in the morning, we're not going to see them for the rest of the day. He said, so I just felt like I needed to put one half down because they lost the rest of that day. That doesn't count. We only count the next scheduled workday. The day of the injury does not count as a lost workday, even if it happened at 7.01 of a 7 o'clock shift. So this is all very important in which box you check and how many days you put. So I do, um, I'm on the the Work Comp Coalition Board here in the state of Colorado. And that's actually, um, um, in Colorado, we have, they have four days to issue that restriction. And so OSHA, according to OSHA, you have to start counting that calorie, that calendar day. But on Work Comp, it's completely different. It won't pick up the first three days until they miss the fourth? Yeah. Once again, Work Comp over here, OSHA record keeping over here. Two totally different things. That, that's a great point. So, any question on lost work days? Hugely important. Um, Kenny? I was just going to share uh, as far as like being in control of certain things. So, uh, we had an employee got something stuck in his eye while I was in one of our vans. Um, sent him to the clinic, you know, did everything our due diligence that we needed to do. And uh, the doctor prescribed him something that he didn't even use. And it's the same thing, it was over the counter. Uh, he, he could get it over the counter. Didn't use it in the first place, but wound up being an OSHA report because the doctor immediately prescribed something. Okay, so I wasn't there at that point, wasn't there to communicate, and you know, the control is very important. Yeah, it's, if, if everybody, I'll repeat the question, so, or the example, Employee got something in the eye. Um, the physician pres prescribed a prescription for something that could have been obtained over the counter. Once again, this is, believe it or not, 
one of the things we have to do is educate the medical providers we work with that this is impacting us. We, we can't have you do something like that. If there is something available over the counter, that, that we're hit, we haven't gotten to that section yet, but that would not constitute a recordable event because it's not medical treatment. The minute they write a script, it's recordable, even if it was available over the counter. Isn't it only if they fulfill that prescription because you can hand that prescription back to the doctor and they can rewrite that side? Well, you know the way that I lean to begin with, right? You know how I'm going to lean on that, right? I, I'm going to lean that, okay, we, we, it, especially I'd want to feel good that I followed up with the physician and said, hey, look, they never filled it, he's okay. If I do that, then I'm not going to count that as recordable. Again, you make the decision. And knock on wood, I haven't, I haven't been involved in more than just several OSHA record keeping audits. I'm not telling you to falsify the logs. I'm telling you this is an important issue that needs to be addressed. Ra raise your hands if you are absolutely concerned about what you're putting on your logs, as you should be. You're absolutely concerned, so you make the call. All right, um, we already beat this to death. Uh, 180 days is the limit. Actually, 180 days. If you have an employee who is injured badly enough, they lose time from work, and then they come back to work on restrictions, the most days total between those two is 180. So you would never want to put 150 days lost work time and then 100 more on restrictions. That exceeds the cap of 180. It's 180 total between the two. Um, and that caps to that year, right? So if that injury happened in 2022, capped at 180, don't have to keep counting it even if that employee is still on restrictions going into 2020. Well, here's what you have to do. The injury only gets recorded on the log for the calendar year. If the injury is, occurs late in the calendar year, you're starting a new log for 2023 but this employee is still missing work, they want you to update the old log to reflect the days that are restricted or lost in this calendar year. But it would still be counted Yes, absolutely, on the old log. You don't carry, you, I, you know how many clients I've seen, well, I, he's still losing time, so I opened up another case. No, you just double counted one injury. Don't do that. All right, restrictions and, and uh, job transfer, same principles, but, but here is something to keep in mind. It all goes, this all goes back to the relationship with the clinic. I can't tell you how important it is. So you have somebody, you, you, have, a, uh, you have an estimator who, uh, whatever reason, has a sprain or strain, it's work-related, estimator. So they go to the clinic and uh, they get a restriction from the physician and the restriction says no lifting over 75 pounds. Any questions from anybody so far? Estimator. Does he, ever lift? Does he ever lift over 75 pounds? So what you have, first of all, is a mistake because the clinic ought to know what that person does and prescribe restrictions that are appropriate for what that person's job duties are, you have a restriction that doesn't apply. And if it doesn't apply, it doesn't count. That job never involves. But the secret is, why are you getting a restriction that doesn't reflect what that person does in the first place? And that's a conversation that you need to have with the clinic. Make sense? All the other rules apply. All right, medical treatment is the other, there's four columns. Death, hope you never have to check that. Lost work days, restricted work days, and other recordable. This is the medical, where medical treatment comes in. Um, <laughs> I have been watching, I was joking about Yellowstone earlier. I did notice in Yellowstone, people that suffer pretty bad injuries are being treated by veterinarians. 
<laughs> because it avoids the reporting requirement that might be required to the police. Um, but, but OSHA does point out that we don't care if you send your employee to a vet, it doesn't matter. They are considered to be a healthcare individual, perhaps for, uh, for animals, but it, it, so if you think you could skirt from some of the recording requirements by having your employees treated by a vet, uh, they've, they've already addressed that particular issue. So medical treatment is not. So if one of these things applies, it is not medical treatment. You send somebody to the clinic to be evaluated. If they go to the clinic, you know, I don't know what financial relationship you have, but if it's a $200 bill and all they do is go to the clinic to be evaluated and nothing else happens, it's not recordable. X-rays are not recordable. Even, so, has anybody ever had an MRI with contrast? You ever feel that, that warm feeling? I had too many of those at one point. That's a prescription medication, the iodine that they put into you for an MRI. That's medication, but it's part of a diagnostic procedure. So that doesn't count as medical treatment if the MRI ends up being negative from the injury. And the other thing that doesn't make it recordable medical treatment is first aid. But OSHA defines what first aid is. And if it isn't, if it isn't on the list that we're gonna go through in a second, and it was medical treatment that was given, it is a recordable event. So these are the things that are not considered medical treatment and are first aid. Using non-prescription medication at non-prescription strength. And they wrote that because of creative record keepers like me, who years ago, when an employee went to the clinic, if the doctor said, I need to prescribe them, prescription strength ibuprofen, what we would do with creative record keeping is tell the doc, just tell the employee to go to Walgreens and pick up ibuprofen and double the dose. <laughs> it was a way around the system. OSHA recognized that, that's why that particular provision is in the new record keeping standard. So if it, it, it won't work if the physician says go to Walgreens, double the dose of ibuprofen. That does make it a recordable event. Tetanus shot, not recordable, even after a cut. Cleaning, flushing, soaking wounds, not recordable. That's first aid treatment. Band-aids, butterfly bandages. Believe it or not, in the early days, a butterfly bandage used to be considered medical treatment. Now it's not. So these rules are fluid, they change. Hot and cold therapy, again, first aid treatment. Non-rigid support, first aid. Uh, <clears throat> this one's always, not just bothered me, but made me curious. Evidently, going to a doctor, if you smash your finger or your toe and you get that giant throbbing blood blister, the doctor taking the drill and drilling through your nail to relieve the pressure, for some reason, that's not considered medical treatment. <laughs> now, I, I, I'm certainly not suggesting you take a battery-operated drill and a drill bit from the job site to do that. You, no, don't, don't, don't do those things. You go to the medical professional, but if they drill the nail to relieve the pressure, for whatever reason, that is not considered to be medical treatment. Or eye patches. Removing foreign bodies from the eye. This gets interesting. So. All of us in the room have probably dealt with eye injuries. You get debris in the eye, flushing it out with water, not medical treatment. Swabbing it out with a Q-tip, the equivalent of a Q-tip, not recordable. Does anybody know where they progress with eye injuries and treatment? They use a tool or tweezers. Use a tool or, or tweezers. They, actually, they actually take the equivalent of like a dental pick I, I love talking about eye injuries. I actually, I had, a, I had a foreman in a group who had a glass eye and he told the group how he got it. He was pounding 16 penny nails, the nail came flying back, literally went halfway through his eye. Then he went on to describe how his first instinct was to pull the nail out of his eye, and I'll never forget this, ever. And when he pulled the nail out of the eye, the eye came with it and he said he was looking at his eye with the good eye 
and there's people in the room, like I can see right now, who are cringing, but a very, very powerful story. And the funny thing was, how he finished the story is, in his own way, he said, and nobody who's ever worked with me since that happened have, has ever seen me without a pair of safety glasses on. <laughs> I'm thinking, no shit, dude, you're, you're down to one eye. It's a hell of a time to get religion. But that's how, how people do. So anyway, you get stuff in your eye. If it, if it advances into the pick where they actually pick the metal out of your eye, and then you know what the most drastic procedure is if the pick doesn't get it and there's oxidation in your eye? They drill it. They drill it. They actually take a drill and go into your eye with the drill. So if that doesn't encourage you to wear safety glasses, then you get what's coming to you. So if they're able to flush it out, eye injury is very common. Uh, oh, you don't, here's what catches you on an eye injury with a recordable. What will they often do with an eye injury at the clinic? Prescription ointment. But there are ointments available at Walgreens. So another conversation. Is it, is it beginning to feel like you're telling people how to practice medicine? <laughs> But, you know, I, I hate to tell you this, if your records are that important, you need to know these things. So, I've seen that happen many times. There was something that got in the eye, it irritated the eye, didn't require anything more than just swabbing it out, prescription salve, prescription ointment, bumps it into a recordable. Drinking fluids for the relief of heat stress. I, I think instead of drinking fluids, we gave it to him more expeditiously through an IV. I, I, I see no difference. He was drinking it, but just without the effort of having to, to lift a glass. That's where I'm going with that one, Beth. Yes, sir. So you mentioned the, the OSHA recognized the fact that you're saying a double dose at Walgreens. Is it the difference the doctor's saying it? Yes. Saying yes. It? Okay. Yes. If the doctor's instruction is to do that, then it's recordable. If the, you know, sometimes if the pain's bad enough, I'll take three ibuprofen instead of two. So that, that's different. That's optional on the part of the employee. Sorry. Could you repeat that question? About, yeah, yeah. So if, if the doctor says double the dose, recordable. If the employee or you suggest, hey, if it's bad, you know, don't take the whole bottle, but you could, you could double the dose. It's a little different. So this is the list. This is the list of things that are first aid. If it's not on that list, and it was treatment provided at a clinic, generally speaking, it's going to be recordable. Stitches. One stitch. One stitch. It's medical treatment, recordable. Even though, again, on Yellowstone, I've seen they have that uh, device, they just stitch people up in the field. I have a question, and maybe Beth can comment, but um, is there, or to what degree, is there some sort of protection in place for the, the employer? I, I just am thinking of like an employee's like, I don't want you in the room with me, right? I don't want you to influence what medical treatment I'm getting, so where's well, I that? I tell them at orientation, I will be there. Until they hire an attorney, you have a right. And maybe if they aren't comfortable with a woman being in there, mm -hmm. I'll set up someone else. But we always have a representative. Because a doctor will excuse you from the room when they're going over anything that is supposed to be done. I guess that was, that was a HIPAA thing, right? I mean, well, you know, that's interesting because... But it's like just some <laughs> random... HIPAA, HIPAA does not apply to workers' compensation. Like because you have to have that information. This is your company's injury that you're handling financially. It's not a health care, private health care situation. Like when they're taking the background information, like if the parent or if the employee still has living parents, what if they died from, I, I'm always out of at that point. But then the doctors know to come get me and they're ready to evaluate them for the injury that occurs during working hours. Talk to your clinic. In fact, I, this morning I, I have an email from a client, and one of the things we're going to talk about is tightening that relationship with the clinic to avoid these things. Yeah, and that, I mean, that was just, you know, what assuming does, but that, that was just me assuming, like, oh, yeah, you, should, you can't go in there and, and advocate on behalf of, right? You're not, not a medical provider. I can't go in there and make suggestions for my, you know, 
Yeah. Feel feel a little bit more empowered. Yeah, absolutely. <clears throat> and clinics that deal with occupational injuries, this really shouldn't be new to them. <clears throat> but if you get a clinic that says, no, you're not going to tell us what to do, look for another clinic. Great. Just saying. Thank you, Eric. I will mention on that, too, is building that relationship of trust. And we've gotten that through clinics where the doctors actually come and they're like, your employee told me you took care of them. And so we know you're going to take care of them if I got right, this restriction down. And if you lose that trust, you're kind of out. Absolutely. Absolutely. You know, think about it. We're looking at it from one perspective. Like, this must be intimidating to an employee to have somebody show up at the clinic. I, I would argue, spin it in a different direction. The employee sees somebody from his employer who cares about what's happening. Enough to actually take time out of their day to be there. We're looking at it a different way, but if, if we look at it from their perspective, now, if an employee says, hey, I have rights. You can't be here. I know what my rights are. I know how long I have to report an injury. You got red flags, and you better get on the phone to your claims advocate with your broker and say, we've got, we've got a problem here. This guy knows the work comp law better than I do. Then that's, that's a different situation. But the message of control shows caring as well as you're on top of things, in my opinion. I think that's a great point that there could be a positive thing that comes out of all that. Needle sticks, um, you know, needle sticks are required to be reported. Uh, it, it's really kind of a bizarre situation. Um, it's so bizarre. So bloodborne pathogens, if, if an employee is stuck with a needle, and a needle that had been contaminated potentially with another individual's blood, that's a recordable event on the log. <laughs> this is really bizarre. If an employee is splashed with blood or body fluids in the eye, that's not automatically recordable, only if a, di a disease is diagnosed later. So needle stick, got to go on the log, doesn't matter if you get sick, you can be splashed in the mouth and eyes and nose with somebody else's blood, it doesn't go on the log unless a disease is diagnosed. Logic does not necessarily apply in all situations. <laughs> Do you have your pens applied to that? To? Needle sticks. Well, by somebody other than? It will probably depend on who it's administrated, administered by. Maybe. Yeah, I don't know. That, a that's a good question. You have a guy drop in the field because he's having a reaction. So they give him so either, epi, yeah, and then they accidentally get stuck. Right. The person who administers it. It's a great question. I will find out and let you know. Because the worst thing I could do as a safety professional is pretend I know and give you the wrong answer. I think that's a voluntary thing. I think you're volunteering to, to help that person perform yes, that. That's true, too. Yeah, that's kind of what I was saying. That's a good point. It's a good point. I don't know. <laughs> you can write me up for not knowing the answer to a question. <laughs> the question was, if somebody administers an EpiPen to another individual, and then accidentally sticks themselves. Well, doesn't the EpiPen retract after it's? Correct. Yeah, but you have to put it the right way. If you take it oh. away and think that that's the right way, you stick yourself instead of the clock. So if you accidentally stick yourself, if it's voluntary, that there's a lot of questions. I will get to the bottom of that. A question I don't know. So Gary, here in this uh, might not be the right place, but. This was my issue with the vaccines, too, is you know, I mean, that's basically a medical procedure. And they were mandated for employers with 104 employees. You know, what was OSHA's stance? Why did they take that stance? At the I mean, it, it, everything I read, they were pushing back against it the entire time. And it was going through the courts, you know, uh, until it went to the Supreme Court and then got 
I, I think it was just a situation where the agency believed that this was something employers must do to help prevent the spread. And, and that actually all occurred, I believe, before they realized that the vaccine really doesn't stop it from spreading or even stop people from being infected with the virus. It's still a medical procedure, and, you know, there's four ways for a chemical to enter your body, and one of those is injection. Well, so. <clears throat> used to be that that would be recordable if you suffered a reaction. The reason they didn't was because they believed if it appeared on the log, it would discourage people from getting the vaccine. That was the reason. And that could get into a really heated discussion. <laughs> Hearing loss, we talked about that before. Uh, retesting, so if you have an audiometric testing program, employee suffers hearing loss. A retest is what's required before you determine. It's possible that employee went out shooting the day before their, their hearing test or took a nice ride on a motorcycle. And that will cause temporary hearing loss where if you have an audiogram, it will show um, a threshold shift. So a retest is required. They, they emphasize the importance of the employee remaining in a quiet environment until they have that retest. We have different forms. We have the OSHA 300 form. That's where we record the details of the injury. We have the 300A summary. That has the number of incidents, the number of hours worked, as well as the uh, code for that particular business. We also have something called the OSHA 301. If you're filling out a state first report of injury form, that satisfies the requirement for a 301. If you have a 301 in addition to the first report, great. The things you're required to have, 300 log, 300A, and then the equivalent of the 301. They want to see some details. Ironically, ironically, one of the things missing on the 301 form so a lot of employers use that form as their accident investigation form. Nowhere on the form does it say, what are you going to do to keep it from happening again? So I can only conclude that OSHA doesn't care if it happens again, which is kind of strange. So your own investigation process obviously needs to include corrective action to keep it from happening again. So here's the, uh, the 300 form. The mistakes that are typically made that I see on this form are in column F. You have to describe, I'll tell you some strange stories, the injury, the part of the body affected, and what caused that to occur. Three things must be in the description. I've seen citations issued for this, <laughs> which this is kind of stupid and ridiculous. Heat stroke, is that, a, is that a legal description to put on that field? Heat stroke. Anybody? I'm seeing a head shaking no, which is the correct answer. So the injury itself is heat stroke. You're going to laugh. I'm not telling you things that haven't happened. What was the part of the body that was affected in heat stroke? Whole body. And here's the real stinger. What was the object that caused the heat or the sun? I, I like sun. I like sun. So yeah, accurate description would be heat stroke, whole body, cause heat or the sun. I mean, that, that's, I have seen ocean. Lacerated finger. What caused the laceration? That's, that's big. Sprained shoulder. What caused the sprained shoulder? Lifting, right? So they want to see all three pieces for that to be legal. I've seen citations issued. In that case, the employer actually earned those citations because of the way they treated the compliance officer. So treating a compliance officer with respect can work in your favor. Because if you don't, they're going to look for every little thing to hang you with. And that was the case in this particular situation. The 300A form, it, it basically, how many of you are using the Excel spreadsheet or another electronic program? It's the way to go. You can still keep them on paper, that's fine. They have an Excel spreadsheet you can download for free on, on OSHA's website, and it will populate the 300A form for you. So, a couple of things on the 300A form. 
We talked about this. I'm going to show you a little bit more. The industry classification, you need to know your code and use the correct code. If you have a business that has multiple operations, you want to pick the code that has the higher of the incident rates because you've got a mixed business. You want to use the benchmark that has the higher incident rates to make your data look better. I mean, you could go the other direction, but you're going to be challenging yourself. And there are big differences when we look at the table in incident rates for different businesses. Probably the most important thing here, the annual average number of employees, um, that's, that's not a big deal. They're really looking for the total hours worked. Big mistake on hours. You're completing your OSHA logs uh, uh, to post in February. So you go to payroll and you say, give me all the hours worked for uh, 2022 and they give you that information. Is that adequate? Does that cover everybody? It doesn't count salaried people. You're getting payroll information. They're going to tell you what the hours worked and the overtime worked. Guess what's missing? Salaried people. They count. So generally speaking, we include 40 hours a week, 50 weeks a year for a salaried employee. When you don't include that information, your incident rates will be higher and worse. Don't forget to include salaried hours. But if you are running an OSEC job, if you're a subcontractor and you are on an OSEC job, you're not allowed to count those hours. So you have to deduct those hours. From your, From your total hours? On the log. Oh, okay, so on an OSIP, they're counting the hours for the project, or the, the injuries for the project. You get the injury, but you don't get the hours. Oh, I'd push back on that. <laughs> we'll, we'll talk about that more. So you're taking the penalty, the hit for the hours. I know they're paying the work comp, yep. but I would say count the hours on your log, because that, that's, that's not fair. I don't think you can. Well, let's, let's talk more about that. Okay. Great, great topic, though. More to explore. Here's, here's the part that I've seen citations for. Once again, it was the employer who earned all these nitpicky violations. The highest ranking company official should be signing the form. Why do you, uh, form. Why do you think that is? Why do you think OSHA wants the highest ranking official to sign the form? Yeah, so they know. Now, I would argue with you, if all they're doing is signing this stupid 300A form, does it provide any context for the data that's on it? No, there's nothing. You should, we're gonna to get to that part. But it's, it's there because they wanna make sure that the highest ranking official has knowledge about what's happening in the facility. So many cases I've seen the HR director, the safety director, or someone else in the organization sign that form. That's a citation, that's a violation. Highest ranking official. And I would argue at the end of the presentation, as a safety professional, as somebody involved in safety, we need to calculate the incident rates, bring that to the executive and say, this is how we did in 2022, and this is how we did compared to our peers. And then let them sign the form. Safety programs are driven from the top down. The message comes from the top, filters down through, that's how safety programs become effective, that's how we build a culture. Hugely important. So, Gary, is that just like, if you have like three owners, for example, it's just one of those owners has to sign it? Or yeah, yeah. I mean, being reasonable, the point is they want the highest ranking official at a location. So, if you're Apple computer and you've got locations all over the world, uh, it's the highest ranking official at that particular location where the log is. All right. Uh, let's talk a little bit about multiple establishments. I think we touched on this before. <clears throat> a log must be kept for, if you have a long-term job site and you've got a trailer on the job for more than a year, uh, according to the regulations, you should keep an OSHA log for that job site if it's going to be there for more than a year. Uh, the number of employee exemption is determined by total company. So you say, hey, Gare, I've got five employees that work at 15 convenience stores. You've got to keep logs because it's the total number of employees, not the number at any one location. The employees that are covered by record keeping, executives, if they get hurt on the job, it's a recordable event. 
hourly, salary, seasonal, part-time, migrant, and then the last one, all directly supervised workers. Here's, uh, this may be some eye-opening information for some of you, but if you provide the day-to-day -day direction of temporary employees, you are giving them their daily instructions, even though you're not paying workers comp on that temp service because they provide the work comp, that's your injury that goes on the log. That's interesting, isn't it? So you have a temp employee and you want an able-bodied person on the job and you tell the temp agency, hey, this person's hurt, send me another person. If that temp employee doesn't come back to work for a week, that's your lost workday claim, workday event on the log. Huge. Not only that, you, you have to take the hit for the injury, but you have to follow up with the temp service company, or for all the temps for that matter, and take credit for the hours they work. Remember, you're not paying the cop claim on that, but the, the injury is going to go on your log. So if the injury for the temp worker goes on the log, you better be capturing all the hours that are worked by those temps to include that on the log to improve your incident rate. Make sense? The one exception, if you go to a temp service and along with the temp service comes a supervisor that provides day-to-day -day direction of the temps, then that becomes their incident, not yours. But this has caught a lot of people up with, with some problems. <clears throat> um, we already talked about some of this stuff. Uh, company executive is considered owner, officer, highest ranking official. We're not going to belabor that. You have to post your logs in a public place on February 1st. At a minimum, they have to remain in place until the 30th of April. You can leave them up all year if you want. Most, most companies do. And to be honest with you, that 300A that's posted on the wall is meaningless. It's a bunch of numbers and a signature. It really is kind of meaningless. I mean, if you have 10 employees and there's 25 incidents, I guess you could draw the conclusion that you're not doing very well. But we don't do the calculation on that log, which is where all the information, at least the important information, is maintained. All right, here's something else that may catch people by surprise. You need to keep your logs current. <clears throat> I've had companies call me and say, hey, look, I'm preparing my log to post. Haven't filled it out but I've got a file of injuries that I'd like to go through with you so we can determine what to put on the log. You're in violation because you have seven business days to record a OSHA recordable event. Seven business days from the time you're aware of that injury to put it on the log, if it is in fact recordable. So waiting until January to fill out your log, if OSHA showed up and said, show me a log, and you said, well, hey, you know, I'll let you know in January when I compile this. They'll say, okay, well, that, that's a violation for not keeping your, your logs current. Okay, uh, you must have five years of logs available if OSHA shows up. Uh, typically, they may ask for three, but they have the legal authority to ask for five years, complete years of OSHA logs plus the current year. And remember, you have to keep those current within seven business days. So that's what they can't ask for. But, okay, so I'm a little confused about that. We use, like, the Pinnacle website to do those logs. Uh -huh. And we don't always know how many days restriction they're going to have, so how can we keep that? Well, that... that not really complete until the end of the restriction period. I, I don't want to... I don't want to outright say don't depend on Pinnacle, but they're populating your OSHA log, which can be used potentially, for lack of a better word, against you. The data that Pinnacle keeps populates that log. I, I would go so far as to suggest that you maintain your own log because you have that data. You know when they come back to work. If Pinnacle isn't putting that on there, I think let, let that 
let that process work. You keep your own log. I see. Well, how we I sort of do this is that I look back over the employees, you know, the days of restriction that are given during their visits, and that's how I calculate. I end up I calculate that number myself. But if OSHA asked to see the data, it wouldn't be on there. It would be available. Okay. I'm not familiar with the pinnacle record keeping. I, I am so passionate about this subject that I wouldn't want any other entity besides me keeping a log. On the pinnacle website, there's a little box you can check that says unknown days that are going to be restricted. Yes. So just check that and then update as, oh, and as you oh, have been doing. Okay. So check that. Okay. Because that will show up. Got it. Beth, do you use that or do you keep your own log? I'm curious. Yeah, okay. But I, I prefer Pinnacle because it is at my fingertips. Right. Um, but I do both. Okay, that makes But check that box. All right. So there. I'm real particular. I'm, I'm keeping my own log. <laughs> And I'm so old school, I, I probably a couple of years ago would have said I would keep a paper log. I'd probably go to the Excel spreadsheet. But I, I would want to be in control of that at all times. But again, you're still not, I mean, you can check that you don't know and complete the yeah. log. Right. But at the end of the day, at the end of the year, you still have to go back in and then update. Yes. Okay. You, uh, they don't, have an, they don't have a specific criteria for updating logs. So you have an injury that occurs late in 2022. It's going to carry over into 2023 as far as the lost work days restrictions are concerned. They don't say you have to do this every, every day. All right, I got to go back into the Excel spreadsheet. Add another day to that 2022 log that they missed. It's periodic updating. So generally, when you've gotten to the point where this employee has exceeded the 180-day cap, you stop counting anyway, right? Believe it or not, OSHA requires, I, I, we just came up with this situation with another client where there was an operation at their place of business that was run by another employer. They've acquired that operation and she had questions about the OSHA log, and I said, did you ever get the logs from the other operation? Well, come to find out the other operation didn't do anything from a safety perspective. So th they had no safety procedures in place, neither did they have logs. That's not your fault if you've acquired another business that didn't keep them. If they didn't exist, it's not your obligation to go back and recreate a log from an organization or operation that was not under your control at the time. I suppose if OSHA wanted to, they could go to that other organization that you acquired the business from and say, you didn't keep logs, we're going to hold you in citation, in violation. All right, electronic record keeping, and then we're, we're going to wrap up. Did, uh, what time did we have pegged out, 11 o'clock? 11.30. Oh, 11.30? Okay. Yeah, people get upset, upset sometimes when we go a little bit longer. So we're, we're essentially not charging a thing for the workshop, but people complain that we gave them more information for free than before. So um, I'm easily amused, so feel free to make that comment if you want. I'll get a chuckle out of it. So electronic record keeping, here is how this works. Not everyone in this room is subject to electronic record keeping. My guess would be 99% of it or 99% of you are subject to electronic record keeping. So establishments, which is what OSHA calls businesses, because it may not be a for-profit business, it could be not-for-profit, whatever. Establishments with more than 250 employees at any time during the year are subject to electronic record keeping. This gets really complicated. If you don't have 250, but you're in what OSHA refers to as a high hazard industry, which is pretty much everything that that's all industries that have to keep a log with the exception of just a handful, and they don't identify the ones that aren't subject to it, are going to have to file electronically with more than 20. 10 is the threshold to keep a log. 
20 is the threshold at which you're going to have to report electronically. 250 is anybody who has to keep a log has to report electronically. It's kind of confusing to explain. This is all in the record keeping standards. So if you wanted to go back and look at this and verify that your industry is included, this is very difficult for you to see. If you're an employer in construction, you're subject to this. If you're an employee in manufacturing, all manufacturing, you're subject to this. So I wouldn't even begin to know to find out who isn't subject to it because virtually everybody is. They just wrote it in a way that makes it very confusing. Chances are, if you have more than 20, you're going to be subject to this electronic record keeping requirement. Um, this includes state plans. So I think I'm, I moved from Chicago, if you couldn't tell from the accent. Um, we had state plans in Indiana, in Michigan, in Iowa. I think the surrounding states, Utah, is Utah federal state or is it uh, federal OSHA or is it a state program? Wyoming is a state plan. In other words, they have their own people to enforce the safety and health regulations. Federal OSHA covers half of the states. States have adopted the OSHA regulations. Half of the states have adopted the OSHA regulations and forced them on their own. So if you have an operation, Colorado is a federal OSHA state. So it's a federal compliance officer who will be inspecting and issuing citations. The point is they're collecting data from 50 states. Again, repetition. 10 to 19 employees. You keep uh, traditional paper logs. You're not required to report electronically. If you're a seasonal employer and your average number of employees is 15, but during the seasonal work you have 21, you're electronic record keeping. So if any one time you had more than 20, you're subject to electronic record keeping. Interestingly, this data must be submitted by March 2nd of every year, even if it falls on a Sunday. Don't know why, it's the way the law is written. So don't do it on the Friday before, because it'll get jammed up and you won't be able to do your stuff. Have you had that experience? Very much so. <laughs> <laughs> now, what, we, what we've been told and what actually has occurred are two different things. I do know employers who have been able to get in after the March 2nd deadline and enter the data. This may just be more government inefficiency to when they lock people out. So I can't tell you you have 24, 48, 72 hours to do this. The point is do it before March 2nd. Now, here is... Here is something that is proposed and you need to be aware of, which goes back to what I was saying before, the importance of keeping a log accurately. OSHA is expected to propose sometime this year that, and once again, we have another threshold. This makes it so confusing. If you have more than 100 employees at any one time during the year, if this change goes through, you will be required to report the details of each incident minus the person's name. We don't put identifiers like name on it, but you're going to put that injury description, you're going to put how many days were lost, and that will be reported to the government electronically. And the intention is to make that data available to the public, which you can see the implications. troubling implications. All right, there are some other provisions in record keeping that are important for you to know. And this is relatively recent. This came out when they came up with the electronic record keeping. There is a requirement that you tell your employees how to report an injury. Now, do you think it's, you think it's adequate to tell OSHA? No, we tell them. You, th you think just saying you tell them is good enough? So how many of you have safety handbooks? And in that handbook, in that handbook, it, it indicates that they're required to report an injury, no matter how minor, immediately to their supervisor. That's how you demonstrate that aspect. Now this is really interesting. 
You also have to prove that you've told employees, this is really interesting, I, I, I love language and words and how we've twisted language and words over the years, that you must as an employer tell the employee that they have the right to report an injury. But I wouldn't leave it there. They have the right and the responsibility to report an injury. What, what I'm suggesting is OSHA doesn't really care, believe it or not, that you tell an employee that they have to report an injury. They just only want you to tell them they have the right to. Do you see a problem if they don't report the injury to you immediately, potentially? Isn't that risk management 101? Let's know about it right away and deal with it? Well, that's where the part comes in. Inform your employees they have the right and responsibility and obligation to report the injury. Now, it, this is really interesting. Well, this, this part, the, the next one, I think. Employers are prohibited for firing or discriminating for reporting work-related injuries. So obviously you can't fire somebody who says, I got hurt on the job. I'm actually skipping ahead in another bullet point. So we've all agreed that a best practice is to have this in writing, have the employee sign off on it. I, I'm going to take this back because, and, and maybe it is in a, a future slide. OSHA has also suggested that disciplining an employee for reporting an injury late is a violation of their rights. I see a lot of head shaking going on. Now, put this into context. Is it always apparent to an employee that they've been injured at the moment the injury may have actually occurred? No. So, I would not put too much into that statement other than the fact of being human and recognizing that it may take a while for an employee to report an event. I mean, if somebody t amputates a finger and they don't report it for three days, number one, they're idiots. And, and number two, I would say you would be well-founded in holding that employee accountable and disciplining them for reporting an injury late. I'm just cautioning you, the way OSHA looks at this, especially with soft tissue injuries, they, they could have a problem with you disciplining an employee for reporting an injury before it may have become apparent to them. Prohibition, they're actually talking about prohibitions against certain types of discrimination in reporting injuries. Um, it's actually in the preamble, so let's go through these. In fact, this is where the bullet point is. This could be a bit of a problem, but you should be aware of it. OSHA has problems with blanket post-injury drug testing programs. What happens is their concern is, did the drugs or alcohol directly contribute to the injury? So I'm working in a factory, and I'm doing my job, and a forklift operator swings too wide and hits me and takes me out. They suffered no injuries, I'm badly injured. A blanket drug test for me, OSHA might argue, is not fair. So what they want you to do as an employer is to use reasonable suspicion. Now, keeping drugs and alcohol out of the workplace is hugely important. So my suggestion to you is be creative in your reasonable suspicion criteria. Is it possible that the employee was hit, was moving around? Is it possible the horn was used on the forklift that the employee ignored? What I'm suggesting to you is that you document, document the reasonable suspicion by being creative of why that employee should be drug tested. Does that make sense? <clears throat> Seems like a stretch that we should have to do that, but that's how OSHA sees blanket post-injury drug testing. I love this one because this, this one I do agree with. A lot of the stuff I don't agree with. O 
OSHA says that if you only discipline employees after they've been injured, that you're kind of discriminating against the employee. And I don't know if it's discrimination, but it's stupid. I mean, if, if all you do is discipline employees once they've been hurt, you're missing the boat. So I'm going to take you to the pyramid. I'm fascinated with the pyramid. It's not a scheme. It's statistical. And ballpark numbers, here's how it works in safety. For every one death in the workplace, anybody know how many people die in this country every year on the job? About 42, 4,300. Used to be 20, 30,000 a year. We've, we've done well. But if you're one of the 42 or 4,300, you're thinking maybe we could do a little bit better, right? So pretty good, pretty good. We're always getting better. Uh, every year, things get better. But that's still 4,200 tragedies. Statistically speaking, for every one death in the workplace, there's 30 serious injuries that occur. For every 30 serious injuries that occur, there's 300 minor injuries. For every 300 minor injuries, there's 1,500 near misses, some people call them. If it was a near miss, wasn't it a hit? Anyway, I call them close calls. And for every 1,500 close calls that occur, statistically, there's 20,000 unsafe behaviors that are occurring. These things are rare, fortunately, but the point is, for somebody to get to the top of the pyramid, they've been playing at the bottom of the pyramid from a statistical standpoint a lot. What we need to do from a safety perspective is we need to focus on correcting those unsafe behaviors because if we cut that number in half, everything else gets cut too. I, I did have an individual once ask me, Bill, he didn't understand. He, he would not have been a good candidate for us. He said, so let me get this right, Gary. I can go to the workplace and I can, con I can commit 20,000 unsafe behaviors. And when I've exhausted my unsafe behaviors, then I move up a level on the pyramid and I'll have 1,500 close calls. So, and and I, I, I couldn't help myself, but you know, it's like, dude, no, I, I, I think you're going to the top of the class with that kind of thought process. So my point is discipline has a role in a safety program. How many of you use discipline as part of your safety program? The point is to identify that unsafe behavior. If Sometimes it's on us. If we haven't trained somebody and they did something unsafe, whose fault is it? It's our fault. That's our obligation to train that person. So OSHA says, if you only, <laughs> I've asked this question of employers before. I've, I've said, you know, d describe your, your uh, disciplinary action program for safety violations. And I've, I've actually had owners say, hey, if they do something unsafe and get hurt on the job, I'll discipline them all day long. Well, the point is, you need to work harder. You need to identify those other things. If you told OSHA we identify unsafe behaviors and depending on the situation we enforce it, you're giving them the answer that they're looking for. Something else that's something to consider, kind of the same principle, same principle. Safety incentive programs. How many of you have safety incentive programs? This has been a controversial subject for many, many years. If you have a safety incentive program that rewards people for not having injuries or claims, that's not an effective program. Why? Oh, not reporting, not, re not notifying you is certainly one element. What else are you doing? Well, aren't you rewarding for good luck? How do we know? How do we know that the person that didn't get hurt wasn't violating every rule in the book and just pure dumb luck kept them from being hurt. Same argument. If you're going to have a safety incentive program, and I'm not opposed to all safety incentive programs, it needs to be driven on the positive actions that drive a safety program. 
particularly for leaders like foremen. Are they completing their, their daily safety briefings? Are they inspecting the work areas? If you're a safety professional and you go into the field and there's a job site where there's, there's problems, in my mind, that's, that's on the supervisor. And a safety incentive program for frontline supervision should include those blocking and tackling skills that ultimately lead to, to a more successful safety program. Any question about that? All right, briefly about this. Fatality and, and catastrophe reporting, they, they actually call the acronym as FATCAT, right? Have you heard that term before? Yeah, it's, it's been around forever. Um, from, a, from a perspective of calling OSHA, there are certain events where we have to pick up the phone and call OSHA. And if you don't, you can get into trouble. You have to notify OSHA within 24 hours if somebody is injured badly enough to be hospitalized. But not overnight for observation. That does not count. If, if the hospital says, we want to admit this person overnight for observation, and they're released the next day, you don't have to call OSHA. And let me tell you, you don't want to call OSHA if you don't have to, right? So we have to be really careful with this. If, now, if they're admitted overnight and they're going to spend three days, the minute you have knowledge that they're going to be hospitalized, the clock's ticking for 24 hours for you to make that call. You get into strange situations. Well, I'll get into those in a minute. Um, also, you have to notify OSHA within 24 hours if they suffer an amputation. I'll skip ahead in the interest of time. An amputation doesn't have to involve bone. If the tip of the finger is sliced off, no bone involved, that's an amputation. Must be called in and reported. An avulsion, if, if the fingertip is cut but it's hanging by one skin cell and it can be put back in place and stitched, that's not an amputation. Okay? So we need to know what these, uh, what these rules are. So. With a fatality, you have eight hours. Horrible situation. Last thing you want to do, if you know you have a fatality, you don't want to pick up the phone and call within 15 minutes. You need to get organized. You need to collect information. You need to have a better understanding of what occurred before you call OSHA because they will We'll talk about how to notify in a minute. If an employee survives an accident, and is in the hospital but passes within 30 days following that accident, you still have to pick up the phone and call. If it goes beyond 30 days, there's, there's no obligation. And again, we're not trying to withhold information, it's just you don't need help like that. So understand the rules, use the rules accordingly. So we have 24 hours to report the uh, hospitalization you may have a situation where an employee is injured and it goes beyond 24 hours before a doctor decides that employee goes into the hospital. That's not reported. It's within that 24 hour window of the injury occurring. Same thing, same thing with amputation. If a, an employee's finger is smashed and they do what they can to save the finger, but three days later it's a surgical amputation, that's, that's not a, a call-in, okay? The, the loss of an eye, and presumably if that eye cannot be found. Uh, this is an even more bizarre thing. The loss of an eye actually means the loss of the eye organ, not blindness. So you can literally have an employee who totally loses their sight, but they keep the eye organs themselves and it doesn't have to be reported. I, I, I didn't make up the rules. I'm just communicating them and having some fun with it too. So yeah, pretty bizarre. Now, here's a, here's a word of caution. If you fail to notify because you don't want that inspection, and I don't blame you for not wanting an inspection, 
If you don't notify and OSHA finds out later, you're going to be in big trouble. True story, uh, back in Chicago, there was, uh, there was a situation where somebody died at work, and uh, it had been several weeks, and OSHA knocks on the door. We're here to investigate a fatality, and a contractor says, electrical contractor says, well, you know, we had a fatality on, on the job site. Joe had a heart attack. And OSHA said, well, according to the coroner, the reason why Joe had a heart attack was because uh, 220 volts passed across his chest and he died of electrocution. That was a willful citation for failing to report that, uh, that fatality. The contractor got cute and said, well, his heart stopped. Pretty cold. Pretty cold. True story. The thing you need to be aware of is if your employee is taken to the hospital by ambulance, there are people within fire departments, within paramedic units that will call OSHA and tell them. So even if you didn't make the call, somebody may. And if somebody else calls about your employee and it's a legitimate, reportable type event, you're going to be in trouble. And OSHA will make statements by citing employers who skirt that responsibility. All right, you have three options. You can pick up the phone and you can call the, uh, the OSHA area office. All of those phones on weekends and evenings give you an option of making a recorded message. You can call the national number, which is on the slide here. The advice I give is you can fill out an online form. In my opinion, time is your friend and you want all the time available <coughs> to collect information and find out before that report is made. So you want to take that slow boat to China and the best way to do that is to fill out the online form because that goes to a national office in Washington DC which is then disseminated to one of the area offices that's responsible for where you're located. It's bad luck. I, I don't even want to talk about a fatality, but just, just some advice is get the scene under control. Obviously, take care of the injured worker, first priority. Take care of other people that may have been shaken up. Um, notify the family if you need to make those notifications. Collect preliminary information. And once you've done those things, then you pick up the phone and call. But give yourself time. Don't automatically pick up the phone and call. All right, so let's talk about the data. And this is actually information not only that you can use, I'm suggesting that you do use it. And that to benchmark. Everybody talks about benchmarking these days and data and how important data is related to benchmarking. If you're not, cal how many of you calculate your incident rates? Hugely important in the construction industry. If you're not cal calculating your incident rates, how do you know if you're better than your peer group. You don't. Your mod rate, if your mod rate's less than one, that means you're better than average. Same thing goes with the safety statistics. So we have three types of OSHA incidents that we talk about. We have the recordable incident rate, and that's anything on the log that resulted in, I'm not gonna say death, we'll skip that one, lost work days, Restricted work activity or medical treatment. If it's one of those three, it's a recordable. The next rate is a DART rate. Days away, restricted or transfer. So that is the rate of injuries on your log that result in either lost work days or restricted work activity. And then we have the DAFWI rate, not the DAFWI duck. DAFWI, we, we have all these stupid acronyms. It's days away from work injury and illness. So that would be only those events on your log that result in lost work days. Three different rates. The calculation is very easy. We take the number of each of those categories that I talked about, multiply it by 200,000, that's the constant, and divide by the total hours worked. That gives you a rate. And a rate means that we do this calculation and if the number is two, that means we had for every 100 employees that we employ, two 
were hurt badly enough to result in a recordable, a dart, or a days away from work incident. That way we can compare a company with 10,000 employees to a company with 200. Now if you're a small employer, one event kind of really kind of screws you because you don't have enough hours to really absorb that rate, but that's just the nature of the beast. A statistical, what would you call it? Statistical fact, Bill? Well, it's normalizing the data. But it, it's hard. If you have one event, you're, you're out of the water. But it is what it is. Here's where you find the peer data. Um, on, on, on the OSHA website, it's kind of tricky to get to, and I would be happy to entertain a phone call or an email if you want me to point you where to find this stuff, because it's not big enough to put on the slide. So please reach out if you want to know where to find it. On the OSHA website, you can find this data. The data is compiled by the Bureau of Labor Statistics. I've taken a page because I'm not smart enough to know how to capture uh, on a PDF the header, so I had to start from scratch. What I've done here is I've shown you, you will find this data compiled by the BLS. You calculate your incident rates using the data that we just talked about. Then you pull up this table, you find the business that cl most closely reflects what you do. And since I've been watching Yellowstone, I'm going to pick cattle ranching and farming. Okay? And then we look for the column. This green arrow is the recordable incident rate. If it's on the log, it's a recordable event. So for cattle ranching and farming, for every 100 employees, 5.8 are injured badly enough to appear on the OSHA log. Similarly, you see this column where it says K, it, this is difficult to read because you just have to, to know which column. Cases with days away from work, job restriction, or transfer, the total would be the DART rate. So both restrictions added to those with lost work days. So the DART rate for cattle ranching and farming is 3.4. For every 100 employees in cattle farming, cattle ranching, for every 100, 3.4 are injured badly enough to result in either lost work days or restricted work days. The DAFWI rate, the rate of days away from work, is this column with the red arrow. So once again, cattle ranching, for every 100 employees, 2.9 are injured badly enough to result in days away from work. So if you understand where I'm going with this, you calculate your incident rate, you find the table with the most recent data to compare your company to, that's where you find your benchmark rates. And again, if you can't find this, please reach out to me. More than happy to help. If, if you as a safety professional or HR or person responsible for safety, if you're below the peer rate, go to the CEO. This is important information that they should know. And if you're below the average, I think you should ask for a raise. You're adding tremendous value to the company. And I've worked this out to work in your favor both ways, actually. So if you're above the peer rate, clearly you need additional resources. And you might need a raise, too, because you're going to have to work really hard to get that thing fixed. But the point is, through all the sarcasm, this is important information. This is a business metric. For many of you in the room, this rate determines the work that you might be able to bid. And if your rate exceeds the peer group and you're not getting work, that's huge. In manufacturing, this isn't used as much. But in construction, it's, it's hugely important. And I think it's important for manufacturing. Don't you want to know if you're doing better or worse than your peer group? There's always opportunities for improvement. So, it's important. This data that we've talked about, the decision of what to put on the log is huge. Because over-reporting puts you at a disadvantage. 
The data that you collect, you need to take it a step further. You need to do a calculation. You need to compare that to your peer group to determine where do you stand. Some common mistakes, just in summarizing the presentation, not keeping the forms current, <clears throat> incorrectly completing the form. We talked about mistakes that are made. You can't read it, but I've got some examples on here that, uh, that point out the mistakes. Uh, column F, the full description, we've already beaten that to death. Uh, classifying the case, here's a mistake that people make. When you look at the part of the form that makes you decide whether to put an X in death, days away from work, restrictions, or other recordable, an injury that involves lost work days and restrictions, I've seen companies put a check mark in each of those boxes in the column. When you come down to do the totals and move it over to the 300A form, you've double counted. The instructions clearly say on the form, check one box indicating the most severe outcome. So an employee who loses time and has restrictions, you X out the restricted work activity box. Make sense? Mark only the most serious outcome. The number of days, we've talked about that too. Make sure it never, the, the total between the two columns never exceeds 180 or the, the total in one column for that matter. The person signing the form. So, in conclusion, record keeping is hugely important. It's a compliance obligation, but more importantly, it's a reflection of your business and the commitment to safety in your business. And it's okay if it exceeds the benchmark. My advice would be, Let's look at, look at ways to reduce that incident rate, whether it's through better record keeping or implementation of safety programs. But it's important stuff. Hopefully, you've gotten something out of the workshop today, some little tidbit that you didn't have when you came in, because that was our goal. Hopefully, we've achieved that goal, but does anyone have any questions in conclusion? I too. sorry. So when you go to post the OSHA 300A form February 1st, if you have, is it over 25 employees at a certain job site, would I have to post that there as well? Because if I have over, over a certain amount of employees at one particular job site from February 1st to April 1st, I have to post the form there as well, correct? Yeah, my, my advice would be to, to post it where you know you're going to have employees have an opportunity to see it. Okay. And then the second one is, is there an insurance guy in the room that can explain the new change from the uh, filing a claim that they're having seven days to report the claim, and I think it went up to 14 days? Yeah, I think it went from four to 10, actually. Yeah, That's I a state law. Know. Then it affected August of it. So, the state but then they get an extra day in the fact it's no longer three, before. it's four, to come back to work. Oh, you're talking about something. I was talking about the reporting. Well, there, there's actually a statute that if they exceed that, that time restraint, they could deny the claim. But it changed, at any rate, it did change in August. I just didn't know if there was an insurance guru that could explain Nat, Natalie, you know the answer. I'll, I'll ask Natalie. In Illinois, an employee had 45 days to report the occurrence of a work-related injury. You literally could amputate an arm and decide that, that, I mean, it's kind of unlikely. You could amputate your arm and walk into your employer's office 45 days later, or 44, and say, oh, by the way, you might have noticed I don't have an arm. I chopped it off in a machine. And their claim is covered. Yeah, uh, so what I'm trying to emphasize, Illinois was not a good work comp jurisdiction. They have, in Illinois, they have the functioning alcoholic defense, where a, a Worker on a farm lost both of his arms in, in farm equipment and machinery, three times the legal limit. And the attorney said, well, he was a functioning alcoholic, able to do his job, and the, the court agreed and said, we'll pay the man, even though he was three times the legal limit. <laughs> so our population of Illinois is declining, not because they're leaving, it, but because they're getting killed and they're not being held accountable for it. I <laughs> mentioned that if you have a job trailer on a, on a job for a year, you have to keep a lock. 
You mean like in addition to what would you already have? I believe what they're trying to do is, is you would keep a separate log for that particular job site. So would you still submit it all together when you do the yes. product? Oh, yes. You're just keeping it separate. Bingo. Okay. And that's kind of an unusual occurrence to begin with. Any other questions? Um, going back to COVID, you're talking about reporting COVID cases. Is it basically we have to prove it was contracted on the job site? Yeah, I'm, I don't know how they, I don't know how they would, I don't know how they would prove otherwise. You know what I mean? I, it, it's incumbent on them to prove that you didn't record a case they believe to be, how, do, how are they going to do it? But if you also say zero, are they going to say a big red flag? No, I don't think so. I mean, you know, th this was done when the original COVID was, was pretty strong. And as it mutates, it's become... It's become the common flu. Why we would treat that differently than any other disease is beyond logic, in my opinion. Yeah. <laughs> Bingo. Bingo. So if, if there aren't any other questions, uh, what little voice I've got left, be happy to talk to you after the workshop today. Um, we do plan on doing more of these and I, I'm not sure if we have a feedback process. Yeah. We, we will have a feedback process. Please give your input. If you, if you thought this was pointless and I need to retire, please let me know. Might give me the motivation I need. Um, but if you have ideas for other workshops, I do know the next workshop we do will be how to survive an OSHA inspection. So if you're in, anybody interested in how to survive an OSHA inspection? And it, it doesn't involve firearms. I'm just going to make that point right now. So anyway, pardon me? No, a little bit longer than next week. Why are you eager to get to that one? Well, you know, we've been in business for a long time. And you just, you know, it's a numbers game. And so I'm just a slight bit paranoid about mm -hmm. it. <laughs> yeah, I, you know, OSHA's... Uh, their consulting services are absolutely free. The recommendations are very costly, but them coming, they don't charge you to come in and inspect the workplace at all. And they'll identify problems. Like I said, the recommendations are really expensive. And I didn't tell everybody this, but as a courtesy for you being here because you're value clients, I did submit your job sites and your company addresses <laughs> to the agency and, and offer you that, that free inspection service. So. Anyway, thank you very much for coming today. Appreciate your participation, and uh, we, we hope to see you again at a workshop here at CCIG. So, yeah, have a great day. <laughs>